Welcome to Citizen Science, stories of science we can do together, aka a SciStarter podcast. In this episode, Caroline Nickerson shares citizen science dating advice. You can go on a nice walk with a loved one, with a new friend, uh, and discover things about the world together. Special invitation to NASA citizen science from champion figure skater Christy Yamaguchi. I know a thing or two about ice, and so do the NASA-supported scientists studying icy comet trails and frozen landscapes on Earth. A cool collection of NASA projects that need your help and mysterious sounds prompt Tampa residents to launch an investigation into noisy fish sex. It's February, the month of Valentine's Day and the astrological sign Aquarius, which is when love will steer the stars, at least according to the fifth dimension. Now, if love isn't currently steering your stars and you want it to, you've come to the right podcast because we have with us Sci Starter's own citizen science relationship expert, Caroline Nickerson, to give us some tips. Hey, Caroline, thanks for being here as our relationship guru. Oh my gosh, I'm honored. Yeah, happy to be here. Great. So, could you tell us a little bit about how citizen science could sort of, you know, help bring people together, maybe even lead to a relationship or even romance? Yeah, well, the thing about citizen science is it's great for community building. And this is true whether you're participating in your home. Uh, or whether you're participating outside. Um, I think the best thing about citizen science is it allows you to be part of something bigger than yourself. So let's say you're doing an outdoor project like iNaturalist. You can go on a nice walk with a loved one, with a new friend, uh, and discover things about the world together, help collect data, document the world around you, uh, and you know, hopefully create some bonds at the same time. But if you're doing a project where you're at home, you're still part of the global community because you're impacting research, uh, you're participating, and with many of the online events we have on SciStarter, you can actually communicate with other people um, via Zoom, um, in the chat, or however. Um, we have different message boards we're getting up for Citizen Science Month this coming April. And even if you're just at home and you're participating in an online project like Stall Catchers, where you're classifying blood vessels for Alzheimer's researchers, you're still part of a big community and you can still communicate with people and um, be part of this awesome group of people who want to turn their curiosity into impact. Okay, so how about advice on planning the perfect Valentine's Day outing? Definitely. And let's walk through this, right? So let's say the first date is Valentine's Day. You participate in Bud Purse together. You're going on a walk. You're monitoring um, those flowering plants. Maybe you do iNaturalist as well and help study the species distribution of these plants. Let's say you get a second date. You could do the Great Backyard Bird Count. It's global. It's one of the largest citizen science projects in the world. Um, and you just share pictures of birds, yourself, others bird watching, um, in your yards or your favorite birding spots in your community. You can bird in urban areas as well. Um, and it's a great way to track different bird species. And it's one of the most cited citizen science projects as well, in terms of understanding how species are changing in response to climate change and other environmental factors. Right. And bud burst is year round. They want data, even if there's nothing blooming yet where you are. And, um, and the great... Backyard Bird Count is February 16th through the 19th this year, so coming up. Okay, anything else you'd like to share? I think a big thing to highlight is you can do citizen science from anywhere, any day of the year. And I want people who are might be spending Valentine's Day by themselves to know that if you do a citizen science project, you're still part of a big community, and it's just a great way to give back to the world. What better way to commemorate Valentine's Day, a holiday that celebrates love? Thanks, Caroline. Great advice. Thanks, Bob. Talk to you soon. Now, I'm sure Caroline would agree that one of the cornerstones of a great relationship is shared interests, and that's why SciStarter's relationship with NASA is so successful. Wait, you're in a relationship with NASA? Yes! For those who didn't know, SciStarter and NASA have partnered because of our shared passion for citizen science. NASA has 40 active citizen science projects, and SciStarter has over 180,000 members who enjoy participating in citizen science. That's why we're collaborating on Do NASA Science Live events, live on Zoom, and the next one is going to be called What's It Mean to Be Cool, focusing on snow and ice, and it's happening on Wednesday, February 21st from 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, U.S. It'll feature the project directors from five of NASA's hottest and yet iciest projects. 
So have you ever been outside when the temperature is well above freezing, like maybe 35, 36 degrees, and yet it's snowing? Well, as you might guess, that situation drives meteorologists crazy. Ground temperature and satellite data say it's raining, and you say, okay, then what's this I'm shoveling? So the mountain rain or snow project needs people like you to let them know if you experience this weird phenomenon so they can fine tune their satellite data analysis and weather projections. Megan Collins is a research scientist for mountain rain or snow. Having ground truthed observations of what is falling from the sky right now is helping to update the technologies that drive those weather observations. And that's why we need many, many observations in different conditions, different humidity levels, different temperatures, different elevations. We're going for a, a range of observations, specifically in mountain areas, because that's where the technology struggle the most. But we welcome observations from, from anywhere. So whether you're in Canvas, Kansas or Colorado or the, the highest peak of the Sierra Nevada, um, we welcome your observations. She says they also need you to report on the opposite condition when the temperature is 32 or below and instead of snowing, it's raining. It's called freezing rain and you probably notice when that happens, the rain crystallizes really quickly on things like tree branches and telephone wires and that can cause a lot of damage. So we're also tracking freezing rain. And while you're out looking for these anomalous rain and snow conditions, you can also open a handy app called NASA Globe Observer, and report on ice conditions on any lakes and rivers nearby. Katie Spellman is a lead investigator for the Fresh Eyes on Ice project. All you do is stand on a safe spot on the bank of the river or lake and take photos in the, the directions that the app directs you to of the river and lake ice conditions, and then you submit them. And you can submit them from anywhere in North America where rivers and lakes freeze and the data flows immediately to um, interfaces used by river forecasters so that those safety alerts can be issued. You can make a difference on this issue and help us be more prepared for um, changes in our river and lake ice. She says that even if you're in a place where bodies of water don't usually ice up, they'd still like your input. And actually, actually those, you know, those spots that are on the southern kind of boundary zone is really interesting, you know, because we can see how the geographic extent of ice is changing, you know? So if you, if you, if you're like, if you are in Texas and you see some ice, snap a photo, submit it because that's pretty neat. Now, Fresh Eyes on Ice uses the Globe Observer app, which is kind of a citizen science Swiss army knife. It lets you collect data on clouds, land cover, tree height, and other earth-based phenomena. Holly Cole at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center works on Globe Observer. Basically, you are taking pictures of the environment, such as land and ice or clouds or even mosquito habitats, and then you're telling us a little bit about what you see, um, like what color is the sky or what do you see on the land? Is that ice or is it grass or is it cement? Um, and so it's, it's very simple. It will show you how to use it. She says contributions like these provide data that can enhance and improve data from satellites. When you are looking from space, you, you see the tops of the clouds and you miss what's underneath. So you might miss things like dust or air pollution. Um, so you're, you're providing a, a different perspective that complements what those satellites see. Also, sometimes it's really hard to, to differentiate between different types of land cover, particularly when you have layering, say you have snow that's covering something or um, canopy layers, it's, you can't tell from a satellite necessarily what's underneath. So having that complementary data is really useful. Now, let's say you're more interested in working on celestial NASA research. There are projects for you too, like Backyard World's Cool Neighbors, where you'll help scientists find brown dwarfs near our solar system. Aaron Meisner leads the project. And the really exciting thing about searching for brown dwarfs in this NASA Space Telescope data is there could actually be some of these very cold celestial objects lurking very nearby to the sun, say even closer than some of the quote unquote famous stars like Proxima Centauri. And so it really speaks to this question of like what's out there even in our very immediate realm of the universe. Brown dwarfs are like small stars made of helium and hydrogen like our sun and other stars, but without enough energy to sustain nuclear fusion. So they don't shine like other stars, and they can be seen only using infrared telescopes that can detect fairly cool objects. 
So anyone can come online and look for objects that move in these NASA Space Telescope data and then report them and we'll eventually sort out how close they are to the sun and whether they are new cool neighbors of the sun. And rounding out our suite of cool NASA projects is SunGrazer, in which you'll look at images of the space surrounding our sun's corona to find icy comets traveling from the outer fringes of our solar system into the sun. Carl Battams is a computational scientist, and he runs SunGrazer. So we're talking about tiny little objects that get ridiculously close to the sun, almost literally grazing the surface of the sun. And uh, during that process, um, all of the, the solar radiation, the sunlight that's hitting the comets causes the, the surface of the comet to kind of boil away furiously and all the dust and ice and stuff gets thrown off and released. And, and they get, for just a few hours, sometimes they get very bright next to the sun. The project's been running for 24 years and has discovered nearly 5,000 comets. Badham says comets have been discovered by 12-year-olds, senior citizens, and every age in between. By studying these comets, scientists can learn not only about the objects themselves and the origins of our solar system, but also about the sun's outer atmosphere. It's kind of like throwing a rock into a pond and studying the ripples. You watch the interaction between the comet and the sun and the, the solar wind and solar outflows, and you can, you can kind of see comet tails that are waving as, as solar wind goes past them. Um, in some cases, we've seen comets go really, really low into the sun's atmosphere and completely fall apart and see all of their dust like clinging to magnetic field lines around the sun. And so we get to learn about the, the magnetic field lines around the sun. So is, there's some extremely unique solar physics that we can learn by, uh, by studying comets as well. So there's, there's an awful lot of information that we can get out of it for sure. Now if my urging you to tune in to do NASA Science Live on February 21st isn't enough to convince you, perhaps a message from Olympic champion figure skater Christy Yamaguchi will do the trick. Take it away Christy. Hi I'm Christy Yamaguchi, a US Olympic champion in figure skating and I know a thing or two about ice, and so do the NASA-supported scientists studying icy comet trails and frozen landscapes on Earth. But they need our help to fill data gaps and accelerate research, so tune in to Do NASA Science Live, presented by SciStarter. Register for free at SciStarter.org, spelled S-C-I, S-T-A-R-T-E-R dot org. And together, we can help unravel the mysteries of frozen landscapes. Okay, I hope to see you on the 21st, or if you can't make it or you're watching or hearing this after the 21st, you can still check out the recording of the event at the SciStarter YouTube page. Finally, you know those westerns where there's a sheriff in a frontier town and he's outnumbered by a gang of outlaws, so he rounds up some townspeople and forms a posse and together they prevail? Well, that's kind of like most citizen science projects, where a professional scientist engages non-scientists to solve a problem. But then there's the opposite kind of western, where a group of townspeople have a problem and say, hey, we need a sheriff to come in and help us. So they raise money and they put out a call and bring in a professional. That's less common in citizen science, but it's exactly what just happened down in Tampa, Florida. People were freaked out by booming sounds, usually late at night, reverberating off their walls. Was it from loud parties? Cars with big bass speakers? A local news team investigated and interviewed marine scientist James Locasio at the Moat Marine Laboratory. He thought the culprit might be excited fish called black drums, mating just offshore. That led to local residents contacting Locasio for help. I was contacted by someone up in... Um in the community here, a woman named Sarah Healy, and uh, she had read some information about it or seen the, um, the, the news story uh, where I had suggested the possibility of it being fish. And so she contacted me and asked me if I wanted to um, investigate that hypothesis. And so um, that's what we have started up in Tampa. He says that black drum fish have a specialized sound producing organ that's activated during mating season, which is now. The love calls of the excited fish can reach 165 decibels, powerful enough to shake the ground and travel far inland. But confirming it required deploying an array of hydrophones or underwater microphones. 
So the community created a GoFundMe site that raised enough money so that Locasio could listen for the fish. We're collecting data now. Uh, we've got four recorders in the water. I think we might have an opportunity to put one or two more in opportunistically, you know, where people have um, a dock available to us. And we'll just uh, record data throughout the rest of February and March and have asked people to keep records of any times that they uh, hear this in their house and the, uh, the date and score the in level of intensity on a very simple scale of no sound, zero, or one, two, or three, low, moderate, or high. Um, and we'll see how that falls out. Beyond figuring out whether the sounds really are the black drum love calls, Locasio says the effort's also helping researchers better understand this commercially and ecologically important species. And it brings together local residents and scientists. It's a really good example of, of how people are in touch with wanting to understand and, and how to engage with scientists and, and um, create a project that um, everybody can be involved in and everybody can get some information from. Um, and perhaps can be built on. So um, we've heard the term citizen science uh, now for a while, and this is a really good example of it, I think. Well, that's it for this episode. I'm Bob Hershon. Thanks for being with us. This podcast is brought to you each month by SciStarter, where you will find thousands, yes, thousands, of citizen science projects, events, and tools. It's all at SciStarter.org. That's S-C-I-S. ARTER.org. Thanks so much to you, the listener, the citizen scientist, for getting involved and making a difference. If you have any ideas you want to share with us, any things you want to hear on this podcast, please get in touch with us at info at Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.